Hi, welcome to another edition of IP Psalm. I'm Heather Boyd of Pillar IP, and my guest today is Amon Rana from Sandorana, and you're in the UK. So, Amon, why don't you tell us a little bit about your practice? Um, okay, so my practice is very young. It's only three years old. Um, started in 2018, um, growing slowly, steadily, um, and we mainly service small to medium enterprises. So people that they kind of know they need IP, but they're not really sure where to go for it. Or on the other end of the spectrum, they don't know they need IP, so they become really reactive when something happens. Um, so yeah, that's that's my kind of market. <laughs> so you're looking at more of the small startups, the entrepreneurs, that kind of thing. And I think you, I yeah. mean, I've taken a look at your Instagram page and I really encourage people to look at it because it's very educational. There's a lot of education <laughs> And I think that's what I mean, that's what I've been trying to focus on is more educating um, the clients uh, so that they recognize IP. Uh, yeah, so that's where we, we met on Instagram and um, and then became uh, associates. So we're, we're working together and I love that. Likewise. Thank you. Is it an agency that you have or is it a law firm? It's more like an agency. I would say it's more like a consultancy. Okay. So my background before I started Sandorana was I was always in house with other brands. So I was working in their IP teams. And because of that, I don't really know how to be a law firm as such. So I guess as well, the fact that I work with small to medium enterprises, I'm almost always speaking to the main stakeholder you know, in a business, either the owner, um, sometimes the marketing director, sometimes just somebody that's not typically a lawyer on the other side. Operationally, yes, we have those things. But really, when we work with our clients, like in September, I went to my clients offices to help them with evidence. Yeah. That's not typically what a law firm would do unless, you know, they're going to second somebody out on on that arrangement so right. yeah I'd say we're a bit more a bit more flexible in in some ways and a bit more accommodating in 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 some ways but I think that's that's um what's needed for the clients today because they want hands-on yeah. they want um to be less legal and more um and have an executive director kind of like that type of relationship yeah, um, and, and at least that's the way I've been running my business for 10 years now almost. Um, and it certainly, <laughs> it pays off, so <laughs> keep at it. Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right, actually, that it's what's required now. I think because the same way we met on Instagram, the world is socializing, growing, and it's all happening virtually. It's, and that just speeds up the pace of everything. So a brand that didn't exist yesterday, all of a sudden today, they do need an IP strategy. They do need an IP portfolio. They do need a, just, I guess, a, a strategy to, to follow. Yeah. And yeah. they're not necessarily sure of that until they're in the thick of it. So what I try to do is when I, when I can catch that type of client and, you know, is to let them know that, look, this is kind of what could be around the corner for you. And these are the IP issues that you should be thinking about, or this is how you should be thinking to protect your brand. And right. It's an it's overall not, brand strategy that you have to be. You, you become that overall brand strategist kind of yeah. thing. Um, particularly, even if they're just starting off small, it, I always look at my clients um, point of, from their point of view of what is their three to five to 10 year plan. Yeah, yeah. And then I counsel them um, on, on choosing brands or, or whatnot, um, bearing in mind that they have to have an exit strategy as well, because nobody yeah. wants to work forever. And <laughs> no, it's true. You know, if you're looking for investment later down the line and it's going to involve a chunk of your business being sold, you know, for a large sum that investor is going to want to know what you've done to protect it so far. Yeah. You know, it, it, and sometimes it sounds simple, but putting it to a client in those terms, it makes more sense to them. And then they suddenly understand what we've been talking about all this time. 
you know, because you, you, you put it in a language that they kind of get and it resonates with where they were thinking they might go one day with their brand that they might come along and, and investors might come along and, you know, they want to look attractive to them. I think you made a yeah. good point there when you're talking about perhaps selling off a portion of that, because we get a lot of yeah. questions about that where they have this one focus and, yeah. um, you, you know, I'm working with a, a new client, new technology client right now, and they have one product. So they, they wanted to focus the goods and services on that one product. But here in Canada, there's no requirement to use in association with all of the goods and services yeah. um, to, before you get registration. So, so we have to look at the fact that in Canada right now, it's taking three to five years to get registration. Wow. <laughs> horrible, yeah. Um, so, so we want to make sure that they're looking at what their projections are within the next three to five years or potentially 10 years um, and include all those. So if, if it's an application that's specific to one industry, could this application be applied to other industries and therefore yeah. we should cover it in those industries as well? So, I, I, I mean, I love what I do. It's so interesting. I didn't actually ever think of it that way. Obviously, you know, talking to clients, we always say, the three to five year plan, be realistic, but optimistic with your specification. But actually, yes, by the time a Canadian trademark application registers, the business could be not running anymore, could have grown into a different direction, could have evolved, you know, into com something completely different. They could hire um, students in Canada that have yeah. other applications that they want to use. Yeah, it's- oh, wow. yeah. So we that's to, a lot to consider. We have to be the forecasters almost in a, in a sense, not only yeah. are we guiding them through the trademark uh, registration process, but we're guiding them through almost like a marketing kind of what could be. It's a forecasting, not yeah. like doing the marketing for them because I am not creative that way. <laughs> yeah, I'm listening to, I'm looking at and seeing actually a lot of law firms, particularly here in the UK, just really leveraging social media at the moment yeah. and it feels sort of like they are in the right place at the right time for their clients because who's not on social media it, you know everybody is I can't help but think that they're now focusing more on social media because of Brexit and how that's affected your practice so why don't you tell us a little bit about that Brexit has been interesting for us, actually. We um, just this week took on a consultant. And the reason for that role is because we needed somebody on the inside who would have access to the EU IPO, but also be working with our firm. Trademark attorneys, I feel we did not want a Brexit. No. No, it's changed. So maybe what we could do is talk about a little bit about what what happened. So prior to Brexit, um, there was just the EU IPO or the C, it used to be called the Community Trademark yeah. um, Application Process. And yeah. what that did was allowed uh, people to file one application that covered 27 member um, countries of the EU. Yeah. And 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 then when Brexit hit, it had to split the UK off from that. So maybe you can explain how, how they handled that. So I have to give credit to the UK IPO because they were tasked with um, cloning millions of trademarks onto the UK IPO register. Yeah. You know, as soon as that transitional date came, that's what they were doing. Um, it did cause some delays to new UK IPO filings. Um, but also it's difficult to say whether it's because everything was being cloned or actually because more people were filing in the UK because if they wanted all of a sudden EU-wide protection, the EU IPO was not going to offer the UK in that anymore. So it's increased filings at the UK IPO, which in turn caused some delays to begin with. But actually I was looking um, this week at our records and so pre-Brexit to get a UK trademark registration to um, trademark application to registration it would take maybe three and a half to four months assuming a smooth process right, right. and sometimes on the lesser end of that scale most times on the lesser end of that scale um, 
but now it's around four months so that's not too much of a delay no, actually can we talk to I mean, I'm trying to be sensitive that I'm talking to you and there's a three to five year delay at, at Canadian IPO they had to change their process with that and I mean we're almost 12 months on and it doesn't feel like we have the final say on how everything will be just because of, of little snippets of information like that that you know yeah. some guidance has changed because they needed to change it because of effects yeah so, so, so we're, we're doing a lot more um counseling in terms of what are the risk factors of, of of registering and what's the risk factors of not registering and and are we able to file an application that is as broad as possible and then whittle it down um, yeah. to, to make sure that you're getting registration for the most prominent or valuable uh, products or services that they're offering. So it, it just, it, it puts a lot more strain and stress on us. Um, and yeah. I'm finding that because of uh, social media, um, clients don't necessarily, or the customers or, or applicants don't necessarily want to go with the big legacy law firms because it, they're too expensive. So I think they have quite a stigma, don't they? Even here in the UK, I yeah. speak to clients and they're not sure if the clock started. In fact, it's one of the first questions they'll ask, is the clock started or can we have this conversation? You know, And this is just to scope out the work. And so yeah. I think people are fearful that, you know, law firm or anything legal equals big fees. I don't think they see it another way um, yeah. until you kind of show them that it can be another way. And, you know, that's not to discredit what big law firms are doing. It's not, it's not to discredit it at all, but it is to say, shop around, you know, right. shop right. around because you can, you can get maybe the service that you want you know, at a price to suit you, it's exactly the same as going shopping on the high street and picking premium, mid-level or lower level. In fact, you might find that it all does the job. At all. I think a, a lot of that is, is just the language that we use with our clients as well. Yeah. Um, Cause big law uses big law language sometimes. Yeah. And uh, that may not translate to the entrepreneur kind of thing or the, the small business or the medium sized business who is moving into new territory. Um, yeah. So one of, the, one of the things I just finished doing with a client was walking them through where they sent over their business plan, um, their patent specifications, but not the drawings. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I tried to decipher what, cause it's all technical speak that's in there. Um, I tried to decipher what their actual product was. And I thought it was, two items that they were used, that they were creating based on the pictures and stuff that were part of the, the business plan um, and the specification kind of thing. Um, but ultimately it turned out that it's one <laughs> one product and I so I I met with the 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 patent person who was I mean yeah. I met virtually with him with the patent person who was drafting who had drafted the the patent. And I said, here's what I understand. And here's what they, they have given me, but the trademarks office and trademark applications, we don't care about what, how, how it works. We don't care. Yeah. We don't, yeah. We care about what the end consumer is going to call it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. It, and it's, it's absolutely true, isn't it? Yeah. So all, and it, that's the same for owners across the board. They don't, they don't care necessarily for the technicalities. And I do I do sympathize with big law because I can sympathize with myself and with you in this way that sometimes you need to really simplify quite complex issues yeah. and that can become quite difficult. But ultimately, it's really important to do that for your client if they're not going to understand it any other way. Exactly. Uh, I think I think it it's incumbent upon us to actually do that yeah. for our clients because they have to understand what they're what they're selling um, yeah. to the public and what what's being protected by the trademark application. So if, if they don't understand that, they'll put in a whole bunch of crap or technology stuff, <laughs> and then ultimately the end product isn't actually protected. Yeah, I had a <laughs> I had somebody come to me once and. Um, and this is this is a mistake I would make if I wasn't in the trade. It's because I'm in the trade. It's because I've worked in trademarks. Same with you. 
we understand it differently. Yeah. Um, but she was running a catering business. And because the venue or the facility where she was running the catering business from was going to have an air conditioning device in there, oh, she decided <laughs> to say it was a trademark for air conditioning devices. And funnily enough, when I was looking through this, I could understand exactly why she'd done it. She was confused as to yeah. what am I, what do I need to pr protect? And it, it's because it's not so simplified, is it? Nobody's going to tell you when you sit to self-file your trademark application. Nobody's going to tell you, you know, you need to just protect what you're offering and what you're planning to offer. If you didn't sell that air conditioning service to somebody, you do not need to protect air conditioning services. And if you're not installing or maintaining it, you don't have to protect the services related to that. Um, yeah. that, that brings me to um, a question because I've seen a lot of this. And um, I, are you part of the Trademark Attorneys Forum on Facebook? I'm not, no. I you probably should We'll sign up for that. Um, but they've been talking a lot about these um, generic uh, trademark filing services that are kind of scammy kind of thing because they don't offer any legal advice whatsoever yeah yeah um, but they're charging more money for them to input the information and spit out the the same information that the client would actually put in if they were filing on their own yeah yeah so there is there is a lot of that i mean i know there's a company at the moment that's bidding on my company name on google ads which makes me feel a bit special, but also, um, <laughs> also know. Um, you know, looking at their website, they are definitely a quantity over quality type practice where it's just like a, I don't know what to call it, a conveyor belt of clients. If you can call them clients, probably not users inputting the information onto the website. The website takes a fee and then the application is filed and then I assume from there onwards just forwarding of communications to maybe the client I assume I mean I don't think there'll be any of the extra padding that that we might provide when we send our updates or extra strategy type information that you or I might give I mean I think they they operate in a they don't really mind if they don't retain clients it's more well, and i don't think i mean a lot of times these clients because they don't know what to do with an office action that comes out the the applications go abandoned yeah, so they've spent yeah. that money um and they haven't ultimately achieved anything out of that so um yeah. i mean it's, it's, some of them can be okay i guess i don't i mean there's probably some legit ones out there here in Canada, they obviously have those. And then what they do is they commission other attorneys to, or the attorneys, I think, they bid on being able to do the back end work for office actions and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. So it is quite, those are, and those are only the legit services. I mean, there are tons that were coming out of, um, I think, India um, and, and the US. Um, yeah that were they're not legit and and yeah. unfortunately what the us uh, pto decided to do was enforce more on the actual legitimate agents who are who are practicing or agents or attorneys are practicing before the us pto rather than um to to try to cut get it rid of the source. yeah yeah cut it off the source exactly so. yeah and I, I but i think that's the same across the board, we have now in the UK IPO a problem in that. So this is one of the one one of the things that I think is really unfair about what's happened with Brexit. Brexit happened, the transitional period ended, and all of a sudden we were just spat out from the EU system. Literally, we could we could not file new applications. We could not um, we could only work on anything that was pending at that time. Um, everything else would require an EU attorney. But the EU attorneys have been given a grace period of some kind for their trademarks um, because anybody from the EEA could also be a representative at the UK IPO. The difference being, 
if you want to be an EU IPO representative, you have to submit evidence that you have qualified um, in a country that's subscribed to the EU, you know, or the EEA. Um, in the UK, a bit like how it was in Canada before, all you need is an address. And so what we have at the moment is we, we're not allowed to get into that EU system, but anybody that has a UK address or has access to a UK address can get into the UK IPO filing system. So they, they not just recently have, but you had to have a UK attorney as the attorney of record? Well, I hope so. I don't know this, Heather. Maybe I should know this, but I, 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 I thought don't know it within the last couple of months. That, Maybe I mean I so the problem for me was not derived from actually the EU, it was derived from bad faith applicants in China. Yeah. Um, harming my clients' businesses and being able to do so because they would just register, you know, like a PO box, post box yeah. address somewhere. It would have a street address, but it's it's one of those addresses that you can purchase. Yeah. And so using those they would then file all of these applications before they'd even reached registration some of them were not even going to reach registration because they were non-distinctive terms but oh, really yeah, no, really non-distinctive terms generic terms yeah. you know by definition the exact same thing here in canada with um there was a company called brandster that yeah. had a uk address and they submitted hundreds of applications for generic words that covered oh. all classes prior to um, the the Canadian the CIPO increasing the fees, doing yeah. classes and stuff before yeah. June 19th, 2019. Um, and uh, like most of them are going abandoned because yeah. they're all being fought and opposed and stuff like that. And they're just not responding to them. But yeah, I've had a, number, a number of cases where they actually cited this pre previously filed and, and confusingly similar trademark. And I'm like, how the heck do you get across that until you have to keep it requesting? So we, it. we took a different line. I had my trademark attorney hat on and immediately wanted to lobby with the UK IPO and say, look, this is unfair, not yeah. least because it's it's unfair on the Brexit side in terms of you know what's happening in the eu and how we can't physically use that system now yeah. unless we submit proof of our qualification i think it should be the same here for anybody that wants to be a representative um, but in addition i also had my trademark hat on and said to you know the client look let's monitor all of these and as soon as if any of them do register because sometimes they would register if it's a generic term but it's you know, got no meaning in relation to the goods and services, it will register. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, we can easily, in the publication period, we can oppose it. And that, you know, we that can- present a, a financial burden on your clients. Yes. That wouldn't yeah. otherwise be there, but for- Exactly. various companies. And, that's and so he was very aggrieved by this. Obviously we sent the letters before action. So this was a a last resort that, you know, if they're not withdrawing these applications, if they're going to continue um, taking down on Amazon using generic trademark applications, not registrations, uh, this is going to be the route that we will take. We'll monitor and we'll oppose and we'll do what we can to make sure that those applications never register. And he came back and said, we don't want to spend it's it's you know it's not our it's not our fault it's not our responsibility we don't want to do this um what else can we do and so we actually just found amazon legal counsel who is going to understand the basics of trademarks and generic filings likely understands the issue with bad faith very well if she's an amazon legal counsel yeah. in intellectual property so um so we we just wrote to her and she made sure that 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 owner of those trademark applications couldn't file any more takedowns. And it wasn't the route that I would normally take. But I do think that the client suggesting that we should do something else did spur us on actually to get a quicker outcome. And I'm wondering if we're just entering that phase of the trademark world where conventional 
ways of dealing with these bad faith applications and, and the harm that they do. Just it's not working. It takes too long. It's happened so many times where we've we've taken the registry route. And by the time we get the decision that we want, in fact, the issue on Amazon or eBay or wherever it is. Has already it's, happened. And, yeah. It's already happened. It's already gone. And so we're not we're not moving as fast. And I don't know. Well, I guess you certainly feel feel this. What else? Yeah. What Canada did was we implemented this um, third port party correspondence where we can file um, uh, if if there's a like a nefarious mark or whatever, then a third party who has an interest in that trademark or whatever yeah. um, has already obviously already been using it or um, knows that that company like Brandster is not using it and, and couldn't possibly use it in association with every single class that they put in there. Yeah, of course. You can file this correspondence um, to say that you have third party rights kind of thing. And yeah. what that does is it notice, notifies the office that, that, that perhaps there's a problem with this application that they need to take a closer look at rather than just letting it go. So yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I would need to check to see if we have something similar. I'd imagine that we do. Um, but I mean, in the US before we've, for matters, we've asked local council to write to the director of trademarks if, if something's not right or, you know, letters of protest, but we don't really tend to have much of that in, in the UK. And for 90% of cases, it's fine. They're very, they're straightforward. Yeah. But for the 10% that are causing a problem, it really does feel like the burdens on the on the good guy. Oh yeah. I yeah, find that a lot burden. with the US too, now that we're now that we're they're taking a hard line on specimens that are filed. Yeah. Because there were from probably I want to say close to 2008 all the way through to 2017, um, but, and probably even before beyond that, there were a lot of um I want to say perhaps Chinese companies or whatever who were manufacturing their specimens and yeah, submitting yeah. them and getting registration based. I on saw a few of those. Yeah. Um, so they've, you know, I, I took a um, kind of a video seminar with them about how to recognize um, fake specimens because it was free. <laughs> and I, <laughs> It's not something I would normally do, but now I'm able to, based on the, what the USPTO presented, I'm able to take a look at that. And when my, my client sends me a specimen, I'm like, mm, yeah, yeah, probably not what we need kind of thing. But, yeah, yeah. Um, and being able to counsel my Canadian clients on what, spec what type of specimens are being acceptable uh, or deemed acceptable in the US. So that, that helps quite a bit, so. Yeah, we so I used to do a lot of that um, like when I was in house, but now the same way I have you in Canada, I have somebody I work with now in the US who I trust to counsel me on those things, on those changes. And of course, I come across it. I've seen the superimposed trademark specimens, you know, the ones where it's just very obvious. <laughs> um, and so, some of them are really good. I, I mean, they weren't obvious to me, and and I've been in this practice for like twenty years, so it's <laughs> some of them are very bad. Yeah, I I, I had uh, one client that um, said that they had this sign over a, a store in New York City. Yeah. And, um, and they sent me the specimen with that, and I submitted the specimen. And they came, the examiner in the states came back and and said. I, I did a Google a Google map thing or whatever. A Google, it's not street, there. Google Street View. It's not there. <laughs> it's not there. <laughs> oh my God. No, Mr. Examiner, this is a new business. Yeah. I mean, actually, you have to say, don't you? Since when? You since when? Since what date? So I guess they could always verify it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, in the case of those cases, you have to you have to your clients. So I submitted and came back and, and it was through another associate from another country. So they believed it as well. I mean, yeah, <laughs> and it's like, I'm not the only one. This is very convincing. <laughs> but now I check all of my clients. 
since then. So yeah. Excellent. Well, um, I think we're going to wrap this up now. This was wonderful, Aman. Thank you so much for your, for your help. And, and oh, thank you for having me. I am awesome. sorry. I'm sure I do have more to share on Brexit, the impact and the UK IPO. But yeah, there, there has definitely been, for, for me personally, just the one issue that stands out is finding a partner, finding a partner yeah. that I never needed to have. And now I need to have. <laughs> and so... Um, in general, your practice, is it primarily uh, direct client work or do you get a lot of foreign and associate work? It's a mixture, really. We get some foreign associate work. We get it's mostly direct client work. And then those clients are the ones that are seeking protection in Canada, say, for example, US. You know, their brands are first they're in the UK and then within weeks they're going to be global or yeah. they already do have a shipping possibility to the US or to Asia. And then, you know, we sort of, we sort of help them by using people like you, Heather. So right. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I've got, client, I, I would say a, a significant portion of my clientele is direct clients. So we send things out like we've sent to you as well. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, and I, and I think that's the, the nature of the small um, practitioners now tending to get more direct client work um, because it's we're 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 doing the footwork with the with the clients so yeah and they they just their requirements grow don't they as their business grows so too does their portfolio well in an ideal scenario it's yeah. proportional growth and so or proportionate growth and so yeah um, because of that we have had a few clients work with us now for as long as we've been going, which is, has been nice to see their businesses grow, but also interesting because, Heather, we've only been going four years yeah. and it takes three to five years to register a Canadian trademark. And I'll be honest, some of my clients have changed direction in that time. Exactly. <laughs> so so uh, let's work together to make sure that we provide our clients with um, the broadest possible solutions that they can, can view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, thanks so much for joining me, Aman. This was awesome. I learned a lot about the UK IPO and how that's um, been changed because before I would just file CTMs or EU IPO applications. So I've got a lot more clients now that are looking for direct work with UK versus yeah. you know, going into countries they'll never go into. So um, I want to thank you for that. Uh, we're going to put your information, your contact information in the, um, in the link below. And uh, we will tag you on social media. So thank you for that. If thank you. Like you. Saw, if you like what you saw here, please like, share, comment below, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Remember, we're not providing legal advice here. We're just um, chatting about IP and uh, having a little sip sip. <laughs> Bye, Heather.